Coming up on Tech News Today, e-books about to get cheaper. Is it worth all the fuss? Also, will Google sell Motorola? And will they sell it to Huawei? And Google Plus gets whiter. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, April 11th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle, the easy way to sell or recycle your iPhones, iPads, Macs, smartphones, and other gadgets from your home or office. Don't just sell it, Gazelle it. Find out how and what your gadget is worth at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zaktar. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we kick around the tech news of the day, try to make some sense of it all. Joining us today, Editor-in-Chief of ZDNet and Smart Planet, Mr. Larry Dignan, back on the show. Welcome, Larry. How you doing? Good to have you back. Thanks for uh, joining us. We got some uh, some good stuff to talk about today. Also, uh, who's going to join us for at least the first couple of stories? Leslie Horn, staff writer at Gizmodo. Now, well, congrats on the new job. Hey, thank you. Glad to be back. Good to have you. Uh, we'll get to uh, Leslie's story about Google and Motorola and what's going on with that in a minute. But we want to start off with Apple and. Uh, Publishers and the Department of Justice. This morning, Bloomberg reported that the uh, United States Department of Justice filed an antitrust lawsuit in New York District Court against Apple, Hachette, HarperCollins, Macmillan, and Penguin. At the same time today, Connecticut Attorney General George Jepson announced that his state and 15 others have teamed up to file an antitrust lawsuit against Apple and those same five publishers in Texas. Uh, this is somewhat complicated story, so we'll try to boil it down for you. Uh, Department of Justice has been investigating this for a while. There's also some class action lawsuits that are still going on. Europe is still investigating this as well. Today, the Department of Justice confirmed that they were filing this lawsuit and then later in the day confirmed a settlement with Hachette, HarperCollins, and Simon & Schuster. The lawsuit was over what's called the agency model of book pricing, which says that I, as the publisher, get to set the price and then I determine the discounts, and it's the same price across all retail outlets. What they were suing them for is saying, you guys all teamed up on this. So it's a collusion lawsuit. The agency model itself isn't illegal. They said, you all decided to all do the agency model at the same time. That's what's against the law. Uh, so anyway, Hachette, HarperCollins, and Simon & Schuster have settled. Uh, and a judge still needs to approve this settlement, but it would... Give retailers like Amazon and Barnes and Noble the ability to reduce prices on ebook titles. Uh, it would end the most favored nation agreement with Apple and some other ebook retailers uh, that were in place, allowing Apple to sell at different prices, even with the agency model. On the separate lawsuit from the states, the states are seeking money. Jepson uh, says uh, that two of the publishers, Hachette and HarperCollins, have agreed to pay $52 million. And I, meanwhile, Apple and McMillian, McMillan say, we, we didn't collude. We're, we're not going to settle. We're going to fight this. Penguin has not settled. We haven't heard what they're going to do specifically. But McMillan CEO John Sargent wrote, the government's charge is that McMillan CEO colluded with other CEOs in changing to the agency model. I am McMillan CEO, and I made the decision to move McMillan to the agency model after days of thought and worry. I made the decision on January 22nd, 2010, a little after 4 a.m. on an exercise bike in my basement. It remains the loneliest decision I have ever made. And I see no reason to go back on it now. So it sounds like McMillan and Apple are going to fight this out in court. Meanwhile, Random House, you may have noticed, hasn't been mentioned in all of this. They resisted agreeing to the agency model for a while. They are not named in this lawsuit. And the best guess is that because they resisted it, either they weren't involved in the original investigation because the investigation started from a point in time before, or because the investigation is about collusion, they can't be shown to collude because they didn't enter into the agency model agreements at the same time everybody else did. Now, uh, uh, barring the collusion argument just for a second, wouldn't Random House want to be part of the agency model because that allows the publishers to set higher prices for books which is where a lot of this, the, the issues came in anyway, where uh, publisher or, or um, 
uh, retailers like Amazon could say, well, we'll sell the book for, you know, two bucks. Right. And we're just going to pay the wholesale price from someone like Random House. Why wouldn't Random House say, no, 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 we want to go to the agency model and then we can set the price of their books to, to set it to a price that we feel is fair. Macmillan CEO actually uh, said, we decided to go with the agency model, even though in the short term we get less revenue. Because with the wholesale model... The publishers get the same amount per book no matter what the retailer's setting it, mm -hmm. selling it for. What the publishers don't like is that under the wholesale model for ebooks, Amazon was dominating the market because Amazon was setting these incredibly discounted prices, sometimes under cost as loss leaders to sell their Kindles. So it was almost as if the publishers were helping destroy the industry they were, that was falling down around Amazon. And so Macmillan said, we decided we wanted to open up the market. We wanted more competition because in the long run, that benefits us to have mm -hmm. more competitors for our, our products. We didn't want Amazon to have a chokehold on it. Uh, yeah, because the publishers actually do make more under a wholesale model. The funny part about this is that the publishers were scared that Amazon would do to them what basically Apple did to the music industry. You, you know, once you set an right. ebook price at nine ninety nine or seven bucks or well, pick your price, and everyone gets used to that price, then you'll never go, you'll never go above that, right? Like, like who pays more than ninety nine cents a song or you know a buck twenty or whatever it is now? You know, you you really can't price more than that and, and that's what they were scared of and you know i i don't know from a consumer perspective i i remember this quite vividly because i read a lot of ebooks and i just felt like i was being screwed i mean this whole this whole apple deal with publishers was only set up to screw amazon and consumers were collateral damage so yeah. i can't say i'm i'm usually not for the antitrust stuff and you know i, I normally think these cases are kind of bogus but in this case i'm kind of I kind of get it. I understand it. And, you know, I, I don't and I also don't think this will be the first run in with regulators because Apple's the most valuable company in the world right now. So if you're a state, why wouldn't you find any reason to go after them? And, you know, I, I think I think everybody's going to lawyer up and this is going to be a protracted war. But it's you know, it, to me, it seems pretty obvious what happened. I wonder if, since the illegal activity here is the collusion, I wonder if these publishers have something in the settlement that stops them from going to the agency model within a term of years. Because if they did it by themselves, okay, so we have Hachette d does it next year and the next year somebody else does it, but they're not, not, not agreeing. They just liked it better that way. They yeah. can still move to that, but I'm, I'm really Could curious. Could that still be seen as collusion, like, because it's within some sort of a five-year period or something? I would imagine that the settlement's probably saying, like, you probably couldn't do anything like that within two years of the other company doing that or something strange. I'm just kind of curious about what kind of... Publishers Lunch notes that the publishers may be able to continue a modified version mm -hmm. of agency pricing. The quote is, Justice appears to have set up a system that will allow a limited discounting of e-books so as to inhibit predatory loss leader pricing of e-books from the settling publishers. So, in other words... Words, Amazon can't just start selling, you know, fifteen dollars books for two dollars tomorrow. They can they can put some some limits in place. So theoretically, though, that means we're supposed to be getting ebooks at a reasonable price, like less than the cost of Correct. paper ones. That'd be nice. The, price the whole argument of the publishers, though, is that Amazon set unrealistic expectations for book prices and has been doing it for years. Uh, to Larry's point, kind of how iTunes did, where in your mind you think, well, this is an ebook; it shouldn't be more than this, you know, amount of dollars. Uh, period. And that can work for Amazon because Amazon makes money in all sorts of other ways. But for some sort of a, you know, online competitor or mom and pop competitor, if you know want to use that term, it's totally unrealistic. I, I do. I do think that there's benefits to the agency model, but I think that this was done in a way that forced prices up. And the agency mm -hmm. model doesn't necessarily have to force prices up. That's what the Department of Justice is after. Now, a few people have pointed out that Barack Obama has been published on Random House, and they're the one left out of the Department of Justice lawsuit. So make of that what you will as well. There's, there's I think a it, might, it might – the Random House thing might totally depend on titles. I, I mean, if, if they don't have a Harry Potter or they don't have a Steve Jobs biography or, you know, whatever it is, I mean, maybe, maybe the agency model just wouldn't work for them. Yeah, and they, they I mean, were dragged I think, I think into it's it. it's title specific, yeah. right? And I, I think not, there's, there's, a, there's a good case that they're not part of the collusion because they sort of were dragged into it kicking and screaming. That could be too. Uh, if this is making your head spin, because it kind of made my head spin all morning, uh, it's all it's because it's all about the publishing industry. It's not something we deal with every day. Check out Laura Hazard Owens' post on paidcontent.com. Uh, she has 
everything you need to know about today's ebook lawsuit in one post. And she's continuing to update it as more information becomes available. It's a really good uh, look at it. That's not the one. If you're looking at the video podcast, that's n- that's not the one I'm talking about. It's a different one by her called "Everything You Need to Know About Today's Ebook Lawsuit" in one post. Uh, and uh, you, you'll you'll get every all your, most of your questions answered. Maybe not all of them, but most of them. All right, Leslie, you've been quiet. Let's move on to your uh, your story. Uh, you broke this on uh, Gizmodo today. Well, I guess Wall Street Journal broke it, but you were the first person I saw reporting about it. Uh, the rumors are circulating that Google is going to s- chop Motorola up into pieces and sell it off. Yeah, I mean, it's not really much of a surprise if you've been paying attention because everyone speculated when. Um, Google unexpectedly purchased Motorola uh, back last August, that it was for the patents. Google's never really been a hardware maker. Um, so it would, it would make sense that they would be selling. Um, so, you know, and it's, it's good for the consumer, I think, if they are selling off the hardware division because it means they're going to focus on what they're good at, which is providing the software. Now, one of the rumors is that they would sell off their handset business, the Motorola handset business, to Huawei. Huawei has yeah, had right. a lot of controversy in operating in the United States. Um, yeah, they're, they make the uh, lower price handsets. Um, so... I, you know, I don't know if if they make sense as the uh, as the um, as the buyer, but there's also been rumors of ties between them and the Chinese military, and 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 and. Oh, I I I think I think the I think the sale to the Chinese makes total sense to me, uh, because the reason this deal isn't closed is because China is looking at it, mm. right? That Europe That's a very approved good point. it, U.S. approved it. So even if Huawei isn't the buyer. Why wouldn't you float this story just to, you know, just so regulators can read it and go, well, hey, they're going to give it to us anyway, so let's approve the deal. And there's no love lost between Google and China, as we know, over the operation of the search engine. <laughs> right. So so why why not play ball with the state-run phone <laughs> wireless company there and, and have some fun? I mean, I think the I, – I don't see a way out for Google. I think they really have to sell – the Motorola thing. One, because, you know, they're going to inherit all these employees. It's like 15,000 low margin employees. They're going to, you know, hit their margins pretty hard. Tomorrow's earnings conference call, it's going to be nothing but questions about Motorola that the company is not going to be able to answer. And then you have all this channel conflict, right? So why why deal with that? You you might as well just sell it. Larry, I totally agree with you because you know, on the other hand, Google's also skating on thin ice with um, a lot of consumers and industry watchers now in terms of trust. And I think that um, if they were going to jump into hardware making, um, it would really piss off OEMs and it would piss off their, uh, you know, 55 manufacturers on board with Android. And, you know, they don't want to do that. And, and the other thing is just Motorola's market share has fallen to like 3%. Um, yeah. They're not. They're not lighting it up on the device front. And, and you know, five years Google's of not, losses. They see all the profits are in Android are going to Samsung. So why would you? Uh, why would you own an also ran? It just doesn't. No matter which way you turn, it makes sense to sell it. And if you are going to own an also ran, why would you be going around like Andy Rubin is saying? No, no, no. We're going to firewall this off. We're going to t- not going to touch it. We're not going to do anything to improve this business and make it successful. They're going to sell it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. We're going back and forth and try to figure out a software company that licenses software out to competitors and then has a direct competitor against it. And there wasn't a lot of examples we've come up with. I think, Tom, you brought up Apple a long time ago when they had the clones. For the limited period of time. Right, which was a disaster, which was killed right away. So the idea that if Google kept everything the way it was and they decided to keep the hardware arm and they're still competing with everybody while licensing stuff out, like nobody's ever been successful at doing that or nobody recently in, 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 uh, in consumer electronics has been able to do that because... It seems like it would annoy everybody and their partners, but also nobody's been successful at it. Why would Google try to do a strategy that's just never been done before? Well, and especially if they've tapped Asus for the new Nexus tablet. I mean, if let's just say that's actually going to happen as it's been reported. It's like, is Google going to have to continue to convince everybody that Motorola isn't getting preferential treatment? It makes perfect sense for them to just sell it off, and yeah. then they don't have to keep making sure that people don't say, unfair advantage. Yeah. And you just, know, they I, want the patents. They want the patents, and I think they want the set-top boxes because Motorola has – it's basically Motorola and Cisco. Every cable set-top box you have 
is one of those two guys. So you think and, they'll keep the set top box part oh, and sell off the certain, room? I agree. Certainly. I totally uh, agree. That makes, that makes total sense. That gives them a living room, and maybe they cook up some smart TV or, or whatever. So I think that makes sense. That, hard, that hardware case makes it, sense. It's just the devices make no sense whatsoever because there's too many Android players. I just would hope that Google stops trying to be everything at once because you kind of see evidence that they would like to be. Um, and, you know, it's more important for them to focus on what they're good at, which at the heart of that is search and software. Yeah, I think they look a lot like Microsoft. Yeah. They're, they're trying to do everything. They look a lot like Microsoft used to look like a while ago. When they had Web yeah. TV. Ooh, right. Don't forget Ow. that. They had yeah. a set-top box division and Very didn't work so well. In, in some ways, yeah. All right. Uh, don't forget, folks, m that Google doesn't own Motorola yet. So this is all very premature. Uh, as Larry mentioned, that China still has to sign off on this deal and actually a couple of other places, uh, smaller countries as well, before it can actually be approved. But it has been approved in Europe and the U.S., so it's just a matter of time. Uh, Leslie Horn, thanks so much for joining us uh, today. Uh, you can follow her on the Twitters at Les Horn. And uh, you've got a new gig at GoesMoto.com. What's going on over there? Um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, we're a Gawker property, so we're right in here with Gawker and Lifehacker and Kotaku. And, um, yeah, Gizmodo is a lot of fun, a lot of great personalities. So please read us. Uh, <laughs> I promise we'll entertain you. All right. Thanks <laughs> nice, so much. Nice plug. Very yeah, nice. that's a great plug. <laughs> well yeah, thanks. Can't beat well played. It. Of course, we'll have you back for a full episode sometime, too, as well, Leslie. Thanks a lot. Always good to see you guys. Thanks. On to Nokia, uh, pulling an iPhone in a way, giving back everyone who's purchased a Lumia 900 $100. So if you purchased it uh, between now and April 21st, which means you can still go buy one and get this, you'll receive a $100 credit to your AT&T bill. So you don't get $100 cash, but you do get credit. If you remember the very first generation iPhone, for a different reason, they dropped the price a couple months after it came out. They gave everyone who had bought it at full price a $100 credit, even though they dropped the price $200. But since the Lumia has been $100 to begin with, you're basically just getting the free handset. Yeah, and it's because of a different issue. A memory management issue is causing some of the Lumias to drop data connectivity. Nokia says a software update is due out on Monday. But Larry, you wrote up uh, a story about how they say they've sold 2 million Lumia devices. However, that doesn't necessarily mean good news for the first quarter results does it no i they nokia well there's a few things one nokia is in a race they have to sell a lot of lumias to offset the the plunging symbian line right that you know because basically today as far as the product percentage goes windows phones is a pretty small portion of the whole overall view so nokia is basically you know they're saying their margins are going to be negative they're going to lose money uh, they're getting crushed in emerging markets, and the only thing they can really compete on is price. And you know, so so their growth is supposed to come from China and India and all those places, and they're just not getting it. So the race the race is on to you know Lumia really has to be a huge hit for them because it's going to have to offset a lot of the dead weight in the portfolio. And if it isn't, I don't I don't know what happens in Nokia, but it's not going to be pretty. I'm just thinking about the Lumia deal, by the way. If you bought on Amazon, you gain 50 bucks because it's only a $50 phone at Amazon. So if you have the credit, it's 100 if, if If Nokia can't get their stuff together with this risk of taking on Windows Phone, jumping away from Symbian and, and deciding, look, Android is not the way to go. We can be a, a dominant player in the game again. I mean, I, I would just think acquisition at some point because they can't just keep doing this. They've been cutting a, a lot of employees. They've moved them from Symbian over to the, the Symbian team over to Accenture. So, I mean, they've been making these moves in preparation for hope, what they want is success. But, I mean, I, I still think they, they're at an advantage that a lot of other companies aren't. Samsung is trying to do a lot of different things at one time. They're trying to have Windows Phone, Android, and whatever else they can get. RIM's doing whatever they're doing. But Nokia, they we'll actually, talk about that later. They have a, somewhat of a strong, it was a very bold move to go into Windows Phone, like, wholeheartedly. And I, I think, I mean, they have the most, again, because Microsoft pushes Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8 eventually, and the, these things seem so similar. I think Nokia is going to get that bump up, and it's not going to be this quarter because that that 900 is all right, but the next generation I think is really what they need to do because all Nokia had to yeah. do really right now was not screw up the reintroduction, and I right. think they did that. Yeah, they're on the and, right track, and, and they're selling. I mean, when I was in London recently, and, and basically I just walked around to a bunch of car phones and asked how they were selling. And, and That's the store for anybody who does thinks he was yeah, walking around stealing warehouse. car phones. It's a car phone <laughs> warehouse. Yeah. It's a unit of Best Buy, but. 
at, but folks were saying that these things are selling. There's pretty, you know, they're, they're getting good carrier support. And, you know, I think AT&T can push a, a bunch of these. Uh, the, the challenge for Nokia and Microsoft, which is probably why these, pr these deals are so good right now, is that they have a very limited window of time. Because you have Samsung's new Galaxy coming down the pike in a few months. And then you got the iPhone 5. So, you know, they, they have a, a Nokia, HTC. Um, Nokia and HTC probably mostly have, have the tightest window. Like they really have to, they have to get a lot of units moving quickly. And, before and you these, don't before do you, these other gorillas get out the door. Do you think that this hurts them? This this having to give a hundred dollar refund for uh, for bad units, or because they're responding, will that keep people interested in the Lumia? I, I think I think they have to respond. I mean, I, I think it's pretty. I think it's a pretty good deal. Um, you know, but but you do see it in the you do see. I mean, you didn't see it in the first quarter results, but you're going to see it in the second quarter results, right? So, right. you know, th this this doesn't Nokia does not sound like a cash machine by any. By any stretch of the imagination, and and giving people refunds on basically giving away Lumia 900s can't be good for your business. All right, let's take a quick break and thank our sponsor Gazelle. Not every phone can you get for free, and so you probably need a little cash if you want to get that 13-inch tablet we were talking about yesterday, or any kind of those new gadgets that are out. Uh, Gazelle, a great way to make some quick quick cash from. Your iPad, your your uh, your your old uh, iPad. Don't sell the new one; that's brand new. Well, I guess you could sell it; you'll make some money. Uh, iPod, Mac, iPhone, smartphone. Go to Gazelle uh, and get some trade up quotes. Go, you go right now. Put in the offer for your devices. Do it today because all gadgets lose value over time. And Gazelle is simple and fast. You don't have to spend a lot of time. G a z e l l e dot com. See what your gadget's worth. Get a risk free offer. They lock it in for thirty days. So just find out. Then you take a couple days to think about it. Yeah, okay, yeah, I want the cash. Mail it in for free. Gazelle pays for the shipping, and you'll get paid fast. They'll, they'll send you a check. They'll send you PayPal. Uh, you can actually choose an Amazon gift card. And they, they, they want your iPhones, your iPads, your iPods, your MacBook, uh, anything you're no longer using. It's a great way to get cash to put towards your latest devices. So go on over there. Get the peace of mind. Uh, that your gadgets are going out in the world to either be reused or properly recycled. Uh, and a minimum, we know Gazelle is helping gadgets find new homes. Remember, just like when you drive a car off the lot, your gadgets lose value over time. So go to gazelle.com right now, get the best offer, find out what your gadget's worth. Take a minute, go there, do it now, because the sooner you get it in the system, the sooner you're going to get your money. Gazelle.com, don't just sell it, gazelle it. And we thank them for their support of Tech News today. All right, quickly through some more discussion stories here. Google Plus redesigned, uh, you may have heard. Everyone loves it, right? Right. I mean, every redesign always goes very well with the large user bases. No you one know. ever... Nobody ever gets upset. Has an issue with change or no. white space, as the case may be. Uh, not, none whatsoever. Now, Google Plus has got this redesign. There's a nice... On the left side is an icon-based menu. They're calling it, uh, whether you like the name or not, a dynamic ribbon, because you know people love ribbons. And it's icon-based a lot more. You can actually customize it. You can drag and drop items. You can remove items into the more section so if you don't want to see the games tab like i don't you can move it over to there so that's kind of neat uh where you used to have circles on the left now they move that to the top so it's not that different uh there's let's see what else is going on see posts in particular circles to the top thing posted to the right of that now the posts look a little bit like twitter like they're kind of like speech bubbles now um, there's a trending on Google Plus section. People you may know, that kind of stuff's there. And to the far right is a buddy list of folks you can hang out with right at that point. Hangout apps change a bit when you launch it. It looks uh, it's very much graphical at this point. You can see icons of uh, your friends right away, who's online and who you can talk to. And uh, Hangouts, again, very prevalent. Also in the left side as well, Explore app. They've called, they're calling the things on the left apps now instead of, I guess, pages. Uh, it's, it's the What's Hot section. They just renamed it. Uh, profile pages changes a little bit, and you have uh, you can have a banner now back there if you don't want those five or six individual icons. And uh, people are absolutely loving all the white space that's all over the place. Uh, I've seen some pretty hilarious stuff making fun of the extra white space. It's trending on Google Plus right now. Whitney Houston is number one, and number two is hashtag white space. Really sure I, you know, the white space doesn't bother me because it's like it's yeah. better than having just a bunch of junk, right? I mean, this is this is my profile photo. I as you called it a banner, but Google Plus calls it a cover, cover photo. photo. That's right. Who else calls it a cover photo? I mean, it's Facebook sort of like does. Yes. okay. I understand that yeah. Google Plus and Facebook are two different properties. They don't do exactly the same thing. 
But why? Why call it a cover photo? Why not call it a banner? Is banner just like too antiquated of a term? Magazines call it a cover photo too. I mean, it's 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 not. Yeah, like but Facebook it doesn't. Lo- this looks word. exactly like Facebooks, except for my profile picture is on, on, the, the, right on the other side. But but as far as the white space goes, I mean, does that really make you mad? I don't know. It's, well, if, if you're I, guess, I I kind of like the design. Yeah. Now that said, I'm not going to use Google Plus any more than I do now, which is basically not at all. But I I appreciate the design and I appreciate them trying to do something different. Um, but but yeah, the the key is is this redes- this redesign actually got me to go to Google Plus one one more time. But yeah. I, I just don't I don't use it that much. That's the thing about redesigns is, and this happens with Facebook too. People get up in arms because things look a little bit differently. But the only time these services change at all is when they actually change behavior. Nothing in this. I keep looking around for now. How is Google Plus actually really different besides it looking different? And it's not. It's not different at all. So if you like Google Plus already, you're going to get used to this. And if you don't like it, I don't see why it's any more compelling. I miss Sparks. <laughs> oh, this, that's right. The, those topics that would help you spark a conversation mm. with other people. Yeah. What I'm noticing about this is that Google switched up their, like pretty much every other property they had to be in line with Google, with Google Plus when they introduced that. They stripped out things. Things changed a lot. There was a redesign of Reader that matched the same kind of look. Now, if they're changing Google Plus again... Are they going to change everything else to match this kind of look? Because they kind of have this with uh, the Google page where you have the research results. On the left side, you do have text links. They're not icon-based like this. Uh, you can't really customize it. You can go into advanced settings. But usually Google Plus at this point has become like it's, it's the, the front runner. This is the thing that's going to de- define the style for the rest of Google because they're trying to make that uniform look, that, that black bar up there that keeps changing and, and the Google uh, m- menu on the top left. I'm just wondering what else is going to change if this is what they're doing to Google Plus. I'm well, not- I think I think they're really trying to show their design chops. I mean, you listen to the Google earnings calls. I mean, Larry Page says beautiful so many times that I guess they think if they say their designs and engineering are beautiful enough that maybe other people will believe it. But they say it a lot. Like they they really they're really pushing this design thing. Um, I'm still skeptical about it, but but they are pushing you know interface and, and that you know that kind of I guess perception at this point, but they're really trying. And you know, I don't know if it'll work or not. But I, I don't know. The white space didn't kill me on on Google Plus. They should use the word resolutionary. Then everyone will love it. Exactly. Puntacular. I uh, I was not bothered by the white space, <laughs> even with the bigger screen where you get the big white space. It doesn't bother me. But what bothered me was Spotify's new play button when I went to use it for the first time. Oh, is it because you didn't realize that you actually had to have the Spotify app running in the background? Uh, and, yeah. In order to avoid a bunch of pop ups. I when thought you tried when I play... click a play button on a website that something would play, not launch an app and give me a pop up screen. And oh, you silly, silly man. Yeah. Yeah. So the the, the deal is, is that Spotify. Uh, rolled out a new way for me to share a song or a playlist or an album with anybody on a variety of websites, a blog or that sort of thing, um, with a little play button. So the idea behind this is, okay, well, if I'm using my Spotify app, I'd right-click on a song that I like, let's say. It'll give me a special code. I then go ahead and paste that code into embed.spotify.com. Then it gives me a nice embed code that then I add into any sort of code on my web page. Anybody who's familiar with embed codes for YouTube, that sort of thing, knows how this works. Well, on a site like Tumblr, they actually take it a step further. And it's really interesting because Tumblr is an extremely popular blogging platform. They have over 50 million blogs. So what I did is I went ahead and embedded this song that I've I've gotten uh, to like a lot um, by uh, Mike Snow's new album. Looks really nice here. We got the nice play button. This is the the cover of their album here, and I I sent it to Tom. Tom goes, oh cool, okay, all I right, I'll play go. This Mike Snow song. I'll go ahead and play this. So then it's like, eh, oh, 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 I'm watching so yeah, Spotify you get a pop up, pop up screen. Now I'm going to the Spotify, Spotify app. loads. Okay. And then I, mine told Yikes. me, yeah, it says failed to load the song, but then it actually did long, load the song. Yeah, the me. song loads. It's it's yeah. it's it's, it's a clunky it's it's a clunky interface. Now that is actually better uh, than nothing because I actually have Spotify already downloaded. Mm-hmm. If I didn't, or if Tom didn't, in this case, it would say, you don't have Spotify downloaded. Would you like to download it? That's a very annoying first impression of the service. But if you say, yeah, I'd like to, and the free version is ad-supported, but really you're just listening to songs here and there in the background on people's web pages, it's not the worst thing in the world. And it's certainly better than right now on Tumblr. Let's say I wanted to add an audio file, just like I did before from the beginning. I go ahead and add audio uh, in my dashboard, add audio button. 
And I either have the option to, let's, if I want to, uh, let's, I want to search for gin and juice. Okay, so if I had gin and juice already on the my computer, version. I could upload it. <laughs> but is that file something that I'm allowed to upload? I mean, is is that the you know you have to? There's a little bit. This of is like, why they're making you launch Spotify because they don't want to embed a file in the web. And well, this, there's it, Tumblr is still allowing you to embed something, but you're now taking uh, a lot of. Um, but you're not embedding the actual MP3 file. You're embedding the code that launches Spotify, right? No. No, no, no. But then why does it have to freaking launch Spotify? Well, because because you clicked on something that I took from Spotify. Mm, what I'm saying is that Tumblr Tum still gives you the option to upload a file your from your file computer. And not go through Spotify Locally hosted. We'll just do that. But, well, no, don't do that. And you know, <laughs> Unless you have the rights. This is, this is well, this That's is like, hey, work. if you don't have a big uh, music library on, you know, stored locally, or you just don't want to get in trouble if some of those files you might not have paid for, this is a great way to get around that. But that's the problem with the law is that everybody has to think about the rights issue. Exactly. Uh, and, and we need a better system, ultimately, that, that makes it so you don't have to do these crazy workarounds. Well, like but this. this is a workaround that's better than nothing. You're right. It is a clunky first impression, but this is something that I am now able to do where if you, have, if you don't have Spotify and you sign up once then that's one more person who might end up paying for Spotify in six months to a year. All right. Let's finish up with uh, BlackBerry Messenger Service getting integrated with Twitter and Facebook. Uh, RIM fans are pretty excited about this. Allows users of the encrypted IM system to quickly share tweets or Facebook status updates directly from the app. Uh, it's part of RIM's enhancement of BlackBerry Messenger connected apps, which is set to roll out over the next two weeks. So the Twitter one is live already. The rest of them will roll out over the next 10 days. A uh, new version of BlackBerry Messenger itself gets animated avatars along with BlackBerry tag integration. Uh, but this isn't really changing the fate of RIM overnight. RIM's latest regulatory filing implies that the flagship uh, hardware division is actually losing money. They're, they're, not, they're spending more than they're selling on the hardware. But... At least some good news for RIM fans, right? I mean, they, they, they get some integration. They get something fun to play around well, with. Well, it, it's, it's another data point showing that RIM is trying to be more of a software company. And, and they're trying to focus on their strengths, which BlackBerry Messenger is one of their strengths. Um, you know, the, on, the, on the corporate side, they're trying to do the device management game. Um, the, the challenge with them is, well, it's very similar to Nokia, right? They're getting crushed in the emerging markets now which they used to be able to count on hands down. And they just can't compete on hardware. And the scary thing here is they, they're not, they're not going to have new hardware for a while. I mean, they're going to refresh BlackBerry 7 devices, but, you know, these alleged super phones are supposed to save the day. That's not till, like, the fourth quarter. Do you think they're so, going to end up licensing the software to other hardware manufacturers then? I think it's quite possible. I mean, they hinted at it their their earnings report not that long ago. Yeah, I remember that. I think I think they're going to look. At, I think they're going to look at licensing. They're going to look at taking advantage of their enterprise foothold, which I don't know. At at, at CBS Interactive, we're handing out iPhones and Androids, so mm. they used to be all RIM. Oh, sure. Now that I don't work there anymore, <laughs> right? Now, now we got the cool phones, <laughs> but it's you know they're just not. They're losing a lot of traction. And, and I think it's it's a big challenge for them. So it's not surprising to me that their hardware business is losing money because it's very similar to Nokia. You know, you have these these low margin phones out in the market and now they're getting killed by low margin Androids. And that was your unit growth. And then you're not selling anything on high end because I don't know about you. I, I see nobody with a new BlackBerry anymore. Yeah, it's, it is pretty rare, anecdotally speaking, of course. But yeah, it's, even it's, the room execs well, don't have new BlackBerry phones; they're still rocking yeah, the old ones. Yeah, that too. So, all right, let's move on to the news fuse. <laughs> Apple announced via its knowledge-based site that it is working on a tool to scan and remove the flashback trojan found on over half a million Macs. Apple's already released two patches, which should prevent future infections, but hasn't provided a removal tool yet. Apple also said it's working with ISPs worldwide to disable the command and control network behind the flashback trojan. Digital notebook site SpringPad, which at one time was more like Evernote, looks a lot more like Pinterest now. SpringPad lets you save portions of sites to a notebook. A redesign of the service shows your saved items in a more graphical grid. It's all the rage now when in the gallery view. SpringPad is pushing searchability in this latest version, which is available on iOS, Android, and on the web. 
According to 9 to 5 Max sources, Apple is working on iTunes 11. The current focus right now is the optimization of the actual software as in under-the-hood kinds of changes. iTunes 11 is also expected to support iOS 6 as both are expected to be released at the same time. The site also reports that iTunes 11 will have more iCloud integration built in. Rumors on iTunes Store and App Store revamp are also still making the rounds. IBM unveiled its Pure Systems family today, and it aims to make setting up enterprise data centers easier. Forbes calls it Enterprise in a Box. First you take the box, then you put the enterprise in it. It allows for thousands of VMs to run on a single system, which reduces software licensing costs built into the system, our management capabilities, security, and internal networking. The ever-popular MPAA says that there shouldn't be a distinction between hosting and embedding copyrighted materials in a brief filed with the Seventh Circuit. Both Google and Facebook have publicly taken a contrary opinion, trying to keep the two actions separate. No surprise there. Makes sense, since their <laughs> sites could be held liable for infringement if somebody embedded infringing material on their sites. The Seventh Circuit hasn't made up its mind on whether it will side with the MPAA or not. According to a blog on the Better Business Bureau, BioWare did not technically false advertise Mass Effect 3's ending. It uh, did technically false advertise, excuse me. The post written by Mar Marjorie Stevens in the Consumer News and Opinion blog says that BioWare's marketing says in absolute terms that, quote, the decisions you make completely shape your experience, end quote. And that's not the case. Stevens says, quote, the lesson to be learned here is that companies should give careful consideration to how they word their advertisements. Yeah, I don't. I also don't think the latest Doritos are the cheesiest, but I'm not sure that makes for a false evidence. <laughs> a new Maryland law makes it illegal for employers to ask for passwords from sites like Facebook as a condition of employment. This is the first law in the U.S. to address this particular privacy concern. And is Cooler Ranch really cooler? I don't know. Cooler than what? Is it ranch? <laughs> Got a pile of compact discs sitting around. Amazon is now accepting CDs in its trade-in program. Give Amazon CDs and it will give you Amazon gift cards. TechCrunch has tried to find out what the going rate is for a CD these days, but Amazon has yet to respond. Trade-ins take six to ten days to process. Mega upload host Carpath Carpathia is calling out the U.S. government for hypocrisy, saying the government has no interest in the servers that hosted mega upload content and that it is impeding a resolution to what happens to the servers. Mega upload leased over 1,100 servers, and currently it costs Carpathia roughly $9,000 a day to keep them in storage. All right, let's check what's on the calendar, Sarah. Well, I'm glad you asked that. Kaz Harai, Sony chief, new Sony chief, is going to outline the future of Sony at a special corporate strategy meeting tomorrow, April 12th. Also, tomorrow is the last day that you can file for a generic top-level domain if you, getting, you haven't already. You getting Dot Dignan? I don't know if I have that. <laughs> I should. You got, you got $150,000? It's yours. Yeah, you got okay. till tomorrow. <laughs> T-Mobile is hosting the HTC One S launch party on April 18th in New York. And finally, Verizon's going to intro something. You're going to love this. It's a $30 upgrade fee on April 22nd. Oh, joy. Just kidding. You're not going to love this. Actually, though. Thanks, Verizon. Before you get on Verizon's back, they're actually the only major carrier that doesn't already charge customers a fee when they upgrade their devices, new devices, on two-year contracts. AT&T and Sprint both charge customers 36 and T-Mobile charges an 18 upgrade fee. All the Verizon hour. customers are really upset today about this, but all of the rest of us who are on other carriers are like, yeah, whatever. We've had this for a while. Yeah. Get used to it. And yeah, Verizon's in. taking away all the perks. Yeah. They, it's really kind of true. I mean, what is the benefit of being a Verizon customer? It used to be like, oh, you got a much better network. You get, you, you know, yeah, the phones aren't as good, but it's more reliable. You don't have to pay that upgrade fee. The LTE in a lot of more places. I guess the LTE. That's the big yeah, hook That's right the big now. hook right now for them. Yeah, you're right. On to incoming. Incoming message. Got several emails yesterday. Uh, Molly Wood was on the show, and we were talking about uh, it should be requirement for carriers or manufacturers of cell phones to make an ability to remotely wipe your phone if it's stolen. Uh, we did mention that Apple had that. Rick pointed out uh, that Windows Phone has that ability to remotely find, ring, lock, and erase the Windows Phone. And Alex uh, pointed out that there are lots of apps uh, to do this on Android. In fact, my wife Eileen uses the Lookout mobile security app, which Alex mentioned as well. So thanks for everybody who uh, wrote in and pointed those out. Another email from Sandy Oliver, who says a 13-inch tablet may not be for everybody, but I've been using an 11.3-inch Windows 7 tablet, currently running Windows 8, daily for over a year, and I would like a larger one. I'm a 65-year-old man, but I don't have particularly poor eyesight, and I would still like a larger tablet, especially if I ran Windows, millions of applications, and wasn't limited like on the iPad. I paid $699, $699 for my current tablet last year, and I'd pay the same or even more for a larger tablet with newer technology. Larry, what did you think of that 13-inch? Did you see that, that tablet yesterday? 
Yeah, briefly. I, I don't know. If, if if you want to play Moses, I guess it works, but that, that doesn't quite... Then you got to buy quite, two of them, right? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. All I will, I will say the Windows 8, you know, those hybrid laptop tablet things, they look interesting to me, but I'm probably a small market because I, I write too many words so that, you know, I actually still need a keyboard. But but yeah, I mean, who? That, that's ridiculous. Last email from Nolan. Hey, Twit team, have you considered the possible repercussions that a centralized IMEI database may have on the secondhand phone market? Such a database may have a chilling effect on secondhand buyers of mobile devices. Perhaps there is a secondary motive behind this effort to establish such a database. I, you know, I, if he hadn't used the word chilling effect, I would say, no, this isn't going to have a big effect on the secondhand market. I mean, it's not going to change the law or anything. It's not illegal to sell a phone yeah. used. But I think I see what he's talking about, which is if you aren't buying a refurbished phone, you're buying a, a secondhand phone, say, on Craigslist or at a garage sale or something like that, even if you could turn it on and make it work, if it turns out that that phone is stolen and it gets reported stolen the next day, it might stop working at any point. You don't. You don't know yeah, when someone might say, you hey. You didn't knowingly get yeah. involved in something like this. So right. now you're out some cash, and it could be a mess. Well, yeah, that, I mean, like, why would you go on eBay to buy anything anymore? You'd have to, like, go to, like, a refurbished store. Like, you buy it through the Apple store or AT&T store. So you wouldn't be able to sell it directly because people would be like, I don't know if that phone's going to work tomorrow. But, I mean, you could say that about anything at a garage sale. I mean, unfortunately, these phones have, you know, little chips where they can be disabled remotely. But you could buy a lawnmower. A lawnmower With that was stolen, and you know you didn't knowingly it'd do this, work. but it was cheaper than the the, the the one out of Sears. It's not remotely disabled, though. But okay, right. just, and it'll and it'll work, and there's no database. Still, was wrong that it was thieved in the first place. Right, there should be point. a database for lawnmowers. Yes. Oh, when I'm mowing the lawn. That's the solution to care. this. Argument. That's your solution for everything. <laughs> <laughs> lawnmower database, make it. That's so. the answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We've come to the end of our show, as you might have imagined. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, don't forget, you can help us pick what stories we cover on every show. Go to technewstoday.reddit.com. That is our subreddit where we take a look and find out what stories you are interested in. Join the 5,907 folks who are in there with our awesome moderators, giving us ideas for stories, voting other people's ideas up and down. Check it out, technewstoday.reddit.com. Larry Dignan, thanks so much for joining us. Let folks Anytime. know what's going on over there at the Smart Planet and ZDNet.com. Uh, you just have to go to the sites. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, but, I'm, I'm so I'm so bad at plugs compared to that Gizmodo woman. I, <laughs> well, you, she just you, had it down. Was, I, I got nothing. Just go say, please out. read us. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just please read us. There's good stuff. You guys do it. great stuff. You, Mary Jo Foley, all the folks over there at ZDNet. Uh, uh, Farber writing stuff? I think I've seen a couple things from him lately. Uh, Farber's at CNET News now. So oh, he's, yeah. He's, he's, all his stuff's we're, all, we're all hopping around multiple properties right, now. So, right. so you'll see me on CNET News. You'll see me on ZDNet, Smart Planet. Check it so. out. ZDNET. You're, oh, happy 20th anniversary, by the way. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I, I liked the little uh, timeline that was up there. Cause yeah. Because Z, ZDTV was mentioned. Oh, yeah. Z, that blast from the past. <laughs> yeah, right. All right, thanks everybody for watching or listening. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. Email us TNT at twit.tv or give us a call. Our number is 260-TNT-SHOW. And Lance Ulanoff joins us tomorrow. We'll see you then.